college kids, it's Tuesday and this is a giant sculpture type thing hanging from the ceiling and breathing. I stand up now. Standing up is cool. This week I'm volunteering at the June Congress of the International Society for the Performing Arts and the reward for the volunteers is that they get to attend the conference for free. Um, which is the way to attend that conference because I can't imagine that any of the delegates are actually attending the conference on their own money because they're ridiculously expensive and nobody who's attending a conference about the performing arts has the money to attend that conference unless their company's paying for it. Fortunately the conference is mostly about arts management so I'm assuming there are a lot of arts management companies who actually have the money to send delegates to the conference but there's also a lot of performances and lectures um, about different aspects of performing arts that are really cool. Um, so today I got to go to two in the morning. The first one was about digital media and the performing arts, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a bunch of people talk, standing around talking about how to use the internet, which seemed like the kind of thing that would not be very interesting to a member of Generation 2.0. However, the speaker was actually really amusing and had some cool stuff to say. One of the cool things that he had to say was um, an idea about how to get people to share your content, which is basically what the whole lecture was about because the delegates were mostly people who were looking to be able to post things on the internet and get more fans of their companies or, you know, groups through Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr or whatever. So what he said was that if you are, let's say, a theater company, and you want to post something to your Facebook page and have the people who have friended you on Facebook or fanned you or I don't know, actually know the terminology is because I don't have a Facebook but the people who you are connected with on Facebook you want to have them like your status so that their friends can see that and also discover you. Um, and what the speaker said was that the important thing in this kind of interaction isn't actually whether um, the people whom you want to click like actually like the content because sometimes perhaps even a lot of the time on the internet there are things that you see and you like in the unofficial sense and then you don't share and he was kind of looking into the reason why you have these things that you just kind of keep to yourself and don't bother sharing and so he talked about how you know, in your life you have different identities and you want to always present a face to a group of people that is appropriate to, to your place within that group of people. So you might have different groups of friends on Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and your blog and your YouTube and your whatever. So if you want something to, if you want somebody to like your thing on Facebook, you need to produce content that, their fr that they will want their friends on Facebook to see them liking. Which was a pretty cool thought. I, I thought that was cool. The second lecture was called Marketing to LGBT Community, which I kind of looked at and was like, oh wow, this is going to be a giant bag of fail. But it actually wasn't a giant bag of fail um, too much because it turned out not to be, you know, this is what gay people like and how you should get them to buy your stuff. But instead, um, the general gist of the lecture is if you try to not be a dick to the queer community, queer people are more likely to buy what you're selling. It's kind of depressing that that lecture actually needs to exist, but it's not a wildly offensive lecture, so good lecture, well done. Um, after that, I went to two Luminato events. Luminato is a yearly, I believe, arts festival in Ontario, and it just does stuff, and plenty of that stuff is free, so I went to two free stuff. Do free stuffs. Uh, the first one was called Habit and it took place at the Ontario College of Art and Design. Um, basically they built a house, not a real house, it was like a little apartment house. Big, there was a big space and they put a rectangle and it was its house with lots of rooms. You know, like apartment, I don't know. It, it was like a kitchen and a bathroom and a bedroom and a living room and the idea was that three actors would live in that space for eight hours a day and loop the same play over and over for those eight hours. Um, except, you know, since they're there for eight hours, they have to do like normal human things like eating and peeing and sitting down and not just performing the play. So every time they leave the play, it's going to be a little bit different. And the way that you watch the play is through the windows and doors of the little house. And my phone is ringing and I'm going to ignore it because I'm on a roll. I'm explaining this thing to you. They, um, 
So they keep doing the play, and you can watch the windows or the doors, or you can go up onto this little balcony level and watch from above, and that was really cool. Obviously just the whole idea and the whole setup does a lot to help make a point about the habitual interaction between an audience and a performer, um, but what I found that was kind of creepy and weird was that um, lots of people, myself included, were actually kind of reluctant to get too up close and personal with the actual play because it was set up so that you know you could like lean on the windows and stick your head in and you know just watch these people in their house. Um, but even when things were happening that were obviously supposed to um, be the center of attention, if it felt too personal, people just kind of shied away and didn't look too hard. For instance, there was one point at which two characters were in the living room just like cleaning up from something, and then there was another character in the, in the bedroom who was getting a phone call, and he was, you know, he was like yelling into the phone about something, but there was nobody actually like looking in the window of his bedroom because it felt too much just like a guy in his bedroom who's upset and that's like a private moment, even though it's a play and he's performing for you and I guess in some sense wanting to be looked at, he's meant to be looked at, but still nobody was actually brave enough to go into that private moment and witness it in some kind of space in between a play and just something happening, a person. The second thing that I went to at Luminanoche was the thing which was in the introduction to my video which was billed as a kind of living sculpture. Um, you probably couldn't see it that well from the opening, but basically um, it's got two parts. It's got the leaves, which are kind of draped. Let's see, this is the ceiling. It's all hung from the ceiling. So you've got like leaf type things, which are draped like this, and then there's a space in the middle, which has more things hanging from the ceiling, such as inflatable little balloony things and what seemed to be, there were, they looked like light bulbs full of a kind of amber liquid and actual light bulbs, I think, and motion sensors. So the idea was that the sculpture would actually respond to its environment um, <clears throat> and move differently according to what's moving around it and underneath it and how different parts of it are moving. I think, I couldn't actually find someone to explain to me how exactly the motion sensors work, but they are some sort of integral part of it. And when you looked at it, um, it once you kind of got into the swing of things, it looked like the sculpture was actually breathing 